All right, I now welcome representatives from Recreational Aviation Australia via video conference. For the Hansard record, could you please each give your name and the capacity in which you appear today? Uh, thank you, Senator MacDonald. Uh, my name is Michael Monk and I'm the chair of the board uh, for Recreational Aviation Australia. And we've got Michael Linky. Thanks, Senator MacDonald. Michael Linky, the chief executive of Recreational Aviation Australia. Thanks for the opportunity today. Terrific, thank you. I invite you to make a brief opening statement before the committee asks questions. Do you wish to make an opening statement? Yeah, Michael, our chair, is going to make a brief statement on behalf of both of us, on behalf of our organisation. Uh, thank you again, Senator. Uh, Recreational Aviation Australia, or you know, we more com commonly refer to as RAOs, uh, is a not-for-profit organisation uh, whose purpose is to advance aviation in, in Australia. We do this through a range of functions designed to enable Australians uh, to engage in aviation-related activities in a cost-effective manner through a simplified set of rules. Um, this is facilitated by CASA, who oversee our operations, and they enable an alternative means of compliance with the safety requirements of the regulator. Our rules are somewhat abridged compared to those that apply to operators in uh, some other parts of the aviation sector. However, our activities uh, that we engage in are equally abridged. Uh, and what I mean by that is in return for a simpler set of rules, our members are restricted to a smaller set of available activities compared to those pilots uh, who fall under the CASA system. Uh, contrary to what some may have you believe, it's, it's not a free-for-all. Uh, the benefits that accrue to the broader economy uh, to us are, are quite plain. Uh, and perhaps the simplest way to illustrate this is through the funding we receive uh, and the safety dividend we provide to the, um, the broader Australian public. In the 2019-20 annual report, CASA notes that their total expenses were in the order of $200 million. Uh, of this, around 86% 80, came from government, re government revenue or fuel excise, uh, which accounts for around $174 million. In that same annual report, CASA states that they have 15,721 aircraft on their register and 31,203 flight crew licences. <clears throat> RAOs, on the other hand, has around 9,700 pilots and about 3,300 aircraft, uh, and that number is growing. Uh, this means that we have around about 21% of the number of aircraft and 31% uh, of the number of pilots. We operate on a budget of around $3 million per annum, uh, of which almost nothing comes from those government sources that I mentioned earlier, the, the broader government revenue and fuel excise. Of the $174 million from those sources, RAOs gets around about $140,000. That is, we administer 21% of the number of pilots, 31% of the number of aircraft uh, that CASA does, and we get around 0.075% uh, of the public funding made available to Australian aviators. Uh, despite this, we deliver uh, comparable safety outcomes to the equivalent parts of aviation directly regulated by CASA. Our accident and fatal rates are comparable to those in the CASA regime, uh, that engage in a similar set of activities. Uh, in addition to this, we receive no additional funding to deliver safety outcomes uh, arising out of accident investigations. We receive no legal protections that are afforded to the ATSB and other government agencies. And we still opt to invest our member funds, our not-for-profit member funds into accident investigations to advance uh, the cause of aviation safety in Australia. Um, all of this comes at almost zero cost to the Australian taxpayer. Um, today, I'd, I'd like to thank, thank the senators and the government more broadly for recognising the success of the uh, system under which RA op operates, that is the self-administration system. Um, recently, in the past couple of years, part 149 of the Civil Aviation Safety Regulations was passed into law by the Senate and, um, and, and other parts of the government. And this will go a long way to furthering the success of those self-administered organisations that, that opt into the new regulations and, um, and enable Australia to continue its, its track record uh, on the world stage. Um, I think we, we both look forward to addressing the panel today and, uh, and we welcome questions and comments from the senators. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, can I ask, why did you not do a written contribution to the Senate inquiry, written submission? 
Uh, we are in the midst of preparing one. Uh, we are currently waiting to see what happens with the um, the CEO uh, or the DAS position at CASA. Uh, and, uh, and we were actually hoping for that to be announced uh, before Christmas. Um, however, we do have a uh, quite a complete submission, albeit in draft form, uh, which we, we're waiting to submit. So what difference will the appointment of the CEO DAS position make to your submission today? Look, I, I think it's it's clear to many involved in aviation that um, you know there's there's mixed views on CASA, uh, and and I won't uh, try and paint an all too rosy picture of CASA from our perspective. Uh, but I think um, for for many who are, are being quite objective, over the past few years we have seen. Um, some improvement in CASA. Um, I refer back to part 149, which I've just mentioned. That piece of uh, regulation has been in draft form for about 20 years now. Uh, and under St. Harmony, um, it's, it's been accelerated and it's finally been made and approved uh, by both houses, yours included, the government. And I, I think um, by having a clear understanding of who takes on that role uh, going forward, I think that gives us uh, a little bit of a, a direction in terms of you know, w which are the pain points that we really need to impress and which ones are going to be already understood by that person. So you're reflecting on whether or not the appointment is somebody from within the existing CASA organisation or somebody from outside aviation altogether. Is that, that the sort of distinction you're making there? Uh, no, not not necessarily. I think we're just looking at the individual uh, in general, uh, whether that person comes from within CASA or outside of CASA. Um, there's good people on both sides of the fence. Um, I, I think it would more, uh, for us, we'd be looking at the individual rather than uh, you know, where they come from. Um, there's, there's certainly some people that um, are quite productive within CASA and there's, there's some people that, um, you know, we, we find a little bit uh, unproductive from time to time. Um, and they're, they're all located within CASA, so I wouldn't say we, we're necessarily skewed one way or another. We can then um, top and tail the submission that we have spent many months preparing already, um, given that we still have some time to put that submission in. Um, obviously, the announcement is made whilst the due date, we will submit our um, submission um, in the timeline uh, provided anyway. All right, that's terrific. Can you talk me through some of the restrictions on your members um, as members of uh, a self-regulated uh, uh, sector of the industry? What are the sort of restrictions that your members have? Yeah, happy to do so. Um, as a, a CASA pilot license holder, uh, I'm, I'm free to fly within reason pretty much anywhere in Australia, outside of controlled airspace, within controlled airspace. Uh, pretty much all airports. Um, there are some exceptions to that, and I, I won't go into too much detail. I can, um, you know, with the appropriate qualifications, CASA pilot uh, or flying authority holders are allowed to fly in instrument conditions. They're allowed to engage in uh, aerobatics. Uh, they're allowed to fly at night. They're allowed to carry multiple passengers. Um, there's many things that they can engage in. In contrast to this, we have a, a simplified set of rules. Uh, but at this stage, that requires those pilot certificate holders to remain outside of controlled airspace, only fly during the day, um, carry no more than one passenger, and uh, and at, at this point in time, although we're hoping soon to increase this limit, uh, we are limited to aircraft of 600 kil kilograms or less. Right. So um, if you were flying out of Mariza, um, would you be able to do that? Uh, off the top of my head, I would say uh, my my hunch is yes. Um, I believe Mount Isa, off the top of my head, I'm not familiar with the aerodrome, but uh, I believe it is not controlled airspace, and I think the answer would be yes. Um, and, uh, and so you've got restrictions of a par passenger numbers, one passenger in addition to the pilot, and you're restricted to aircraft of uh, 600 kilograms, is that right? That's correct, yes. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the, uh, you referred to ATSB and their uh, reviews of uh, accidents um, within the broader uh, aviation um, industry. 
Uh, are you required to provide your safety, uh, your accident reviews to ATSB or to the uh, manufacturer of the aircraft? It came but up in last inquiry. Yeah, it's interesting that the use of the word required. Um, there's no requirement. There's no requirement for RLs to actually investigate. Um, it's a very complex field. Um, this one, the ATSB, if they choose to investigate an accident, um, whether it's aircraft, um, marine or rail, um, they then have control of the, the accident scene and the, the police don't then control that scene and they have certain protections under the, the Transport Safety Investigation Act. If RLs investigates an accident, we first must be invited by the police or the investigating authority, generally the police, um, and at all times that accident scene is the realm of the police and we're simply a subject matter expert providing subject matter expertise and guidance on what may or may not have happened to cause that accident given that the police don't have that expertise. So we prepare a report at all times that report is the property of the police and the coroner um, and the various coroner's rules around the country um, require that subject matter expertise reports remain the property of the coroner. It's only the coroner who can release it. So RLs doesn't have a choice whether we release this, despite the pressure that, that some other agencies or some claims that people make that we're refusing or we're not playing the ball, there's actually no legal requirement, uh, no legal possibility for us to release those reports. There are two exceptions to that. We may be ordered by the ATSB under Section 32 of the Transport Safety Investigation Act to provide the ATSB with a copy of that report, and we, of course, would comply with that legal requirement. Similarly, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority may um, compel us to provide them with a copy of the report. Now, that's happened both times in the past. Um, all, every report, we've been investigating accidents for, for 40 years um, as an organisation, and this topic um, has never come up other than in the last couple of years where there's been some contention around an accident report involving a specific type of aircraft. Um, we've supplied that report to the ATSB, we've supplied it to CASA, um, and they will do what they choose to do um, with those reports. Um, if the government wishes to fund RLs or provide RLs with, more importantly, legal protections, um, which you have the authority to do, um, we could then easily release our reports. But right now, if we release our report, our staff and our organisation is exposed to untold litigation from people for what we would say in that report. And that's a different playing field to the playing field that the ATSB plays at. Um, so we're, we're not able to comply with any request to release those reports. Mick, you might have some more on that. Uh, no, just other than just to reinforce it, um, from time to time we do get requests for those reports. And, and as Michael said, unless we are legally compelled to do so, uh, we simply refer those requests onto the coroner um, or the police, depending on, on who owns this jurisdiction. And, uh, and and it's up to their discretion whether those reports are released. <laughs> Realistically, we would we would like nothing more than to be able to release those reports. We think it's important. Um, and in, in the past, uh, several accidents in the past where we have seen that there has been a safety imperative, we've spoken directly to manufacturers uh, about that. An example is an aircraft accident in 2015 involving a specific type of aircraft within seven days. RAOs contacted that manufacturer and said we have safety concerns about this aircraft. There's been several other types of aircraft in that ensuing time where we've noted safety related issues and we've communicated those safety related issues to specific manufacturers. If we have a safety concern about uh, an incident, we will, without releasing our report, we will communicate with that manufacturer or issue a safety notice to our members in those regards. We're very focused on safety. We would deeply love to have the similar protections that the ATSB have because it would get these reports out into the open or we would deeply love the government to provide additional funding to the ATSB and then they could investigate RL's accidents. We don't choose to do these. Uh, we're not required to do them. We do them at the request of the police and request of our community to provide safety assurance to our community. So if um, RAOS is applying to be able to have heavier weighted aircraft, uh, would that be a complementary part of your application that the ATSB would then be required to investigate accidents of uh, a broader range and a, and a heavier aircraft? Uh, I wouldn't say to be a part of our proposal. It would certainly be a welcome addition uh, if that were to be the case that the ATSB was provided with additional funding. But I think it's important to note that um, 
it's not just RAOS accidents that the ATSB elects not to investigate. Um, there are many uh, accidents that occur uh, with VH registered or CASA registered aircraft that the ATSB simply does not have the funding to uh, to investigate. So whilst we might gain uh, some additional aircraft on our register, and should those aircraft be involved in some sort of accident or incident, you know, that would likely not be involved by the ATSB. It's important to note that in many instances, those, in those accidents would not be investigated anyway, even if those aircraft remained on the CASA register. This isn't unique to, to Recreational Aviation Australia. The Sport Aircraft Federation of Australia, formerly the Hang Gliding Federation of Australia, they investigate their own accidents as well. Um, so this is a unique thing that RLS does. It is done by other self-administering organisations. I think the, the fundamental flaw in the system here is that the ATSB aren't provided with the appropriate level of resources and people don't have a, a clear understanding of the roles that self-administering organisations take. And if more funding was provided to the ATSB, there may be more opportunity for a more broader investigation of all aviation-related accidents. Um, if, if, I might, if I might add, uh, a number of years ago, and when we're talking a few decades now, um, there was a series of high-profile accidents um, which triggered a, um, a, a review of how accident investigations are handled. And that resulted in a separation of the investigation function uh, away from what we now know as CASA. Um, and I think that is equally as valid here. Uh, we, are, we are not legally compelled to investigate accidents. We think it's in the interest of aviation safety that we do so. Um, but we would be very welcome uh, of the, the potential for the AGSB as an independent body to come and investigate our accidents if they were provided with sufficient funding to do that. So we've just heard evidence from Mr Cassidy about the cost of licensing for aviation uh, particularly for helicopter pilots, I guess. Do you have any helicopters um, in your association? No, we we mainly have fixed wing. We have uh, several weight shift aircraft and a couple of other smaller categories. Uh, the vast majority of our aircraft, though, are fixed wing uh, aircraft, aeroplanes of the, the traditional nature. So what would it cost on average to be licensed to be an RAOs member? Oh. Um, it, it, it is a, sorry, it is a, a bit of an open-ended question. Um, I, I think it's, it's useful to talk about minimums to gain a qualification. Uh, the minimum hour requirement for RAOs is 20 hours before you get your, um, your very first qualification. After that, you add on additional qualifications to be allowed to carry passengers, uh, do navigation, um, fly different aircraft, etc. That first basic qualification could cost anywhere between, I'll say around about six and ten thousand um, dollars. Twenty hours, based on uh, you know somewhere in the order of two and a half to, uh, sorry, two hundred and fifty to, to three hundred dollars, um, plus a few additional costs. Uh, in contrast to that, uh, to fly a GA registered aircraft, um, you know, while the rates do vary, uh, it, it's not uncommon to see a, a GA registered or a CASA registered aircraft. Um, of a basic nature that, that costs somewhere in the order of, you know, four to $500 uh, per hour to hire. And then you've got to add on your incidental costs on top of that. Yeah, there's some research out there that suggests um, learning in an RBL's aircraft is up to 70% cheaper than a learning in a traditional um, GA aircraft. And that, that's one reason that, that our sector is growing and continues to grow. Uh, we've experienced about 11% growth in the last three years. We know the conference made this morning by AOPA, where the sector is in decline. And, and whilst the, the, the fairly narrow definition of GA and, and AOPA were quite careful to specifically you know, exclude RAL's aircraft from that category, um, it's important to note that GA does include unrated aircraft. And, and we, as Mick said, 3,300 aircraft on our system and almost 10,000 pilots, 11% uh, more than we had three years ago. So people are seeing the value of, of recreational aircraft, the economy available to them in terms of the money that they spend to gain the qualification. Um, and it's a choice. People have a choice. There's no requirement that they come to RLs. We're not a... Um, 
Um, properly as such, there are ninety-five percent of the aircraft on our register can also be registered with CASA on the VH register. So people have a choice, and people are choosing to register with RLs because our aircraft are safe. Our schools—we have one hundred and sixty-five flight training schools across the country, most of them in rural and remote areas, really supporting rural and remote communities. Um, the asset value is about five hundred million dollars worth of assets um, in aircraft used in RAL flight schools, with about four hundred million dollars invested into the Australian economy. So it's a significant movement and significant opportunity for people to get into recreational flying. <laughs> Certainly, I don't want to get in between two industry organisations. If you were having some some discussions, you want to take offline on that. But I, I am interested uh, um, in the application of aviation in, in regional and uh, rural and remote Australia. So um, if you were somebody who was going to carry their family because you lived on a remote property, if you're going to carry staff around more than one, um, if you're going to transport goods, um, would you be able to, you wouldn't be able to have a, an RAL's licence by the sounds of that? Uh, no, that's, that's not entirely true, uh, Senator McDonald. Um, a lot of our aircraft are, are used on farms and stations and whatnot for exactly those purposes. But you said you couldn't have more than one passenger. Oh, I was just about to say, probably with the exception of the, the passengers. Uh, but many of many of our aircraft, uh, people use them to check uh, locations of cattle, dam pools, um, fences, carting tools from one side of a station to another. Um, just in recent weeks, I was at a station called Clifton Hills, um, pretty much in the middle of Australia. Uh, and you know that that's a station that's the size of a small country. I think it's the second largest cattle station in the world from memory, and um, and they use aircraft extensively. Um, whilst I can't say exactly what aircraft they they do use, uh, I can say that's that's an exact scenario where some of our aircraft are used. Uh, Ratio, um, this is how we go for time. Um, can I ask you too about uh, medicals? Um, so, do you have a different requirement for medicals um, in your um, your association than others? Um, we we do. Uh, it, it depends on what you're comparing us to, though. If you're comparing us with a PPL holder, um, that is a private pilot license holder from Tokyo, uh, then yes, we 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 do. We have a, a self-declared model. Uh, which essentially says that you can engage in those activities we've previously discussed um, if you are fit to drive a motor vehicle. Um, whilst I say it's different to a PPL, it's not different to different jurisdictions or other jurisdictions around the world. We've certainly got our counterparts, um, you know, our self-administered equivalents uh, in countries like the UK, uh, in, even across in New Zealand, um, they have an equivalent. Uh, and they work on similar schemes. And indeed, even the FAA in uh, the US, although they they directly administer it through the FAA, um, they have what's called a sport pilot license. And it essentially says that um, with, with a couple of little complications over the top, um, in simple terms, it says, if you hold a motor, drive, uh, motor vehicle driver's license, uh, then you are considered medically fit enough to hold a um, a sport pilot license, which is the equivalent of what uh, we offer through RALs. And I think that's the that's common sense that's situation that's that we have it, because if you think a person who holds a PPL could ultimately go and operate an A380, the largest aircraft in the fleet, but someone with an RAL license can't operate heavier aircraft. So having that different medical regime is an appropriate mix or appropriate fit for the type of services and the type of activities that our pilots do. So there's no, nothing wrong with different. Um, it is just different, as we explained. There are a whole range of limitations placed on our aircraft and where they can operate now. Um, that medical regime fits the, top, the type of aircraft and the type of operation that we're doing. So if you're a um, PPL holder with, um, you know, operating a Cessna 206 uh, somewhere in regional Australia, you're not flying a, you know, a jet, um, but you do have to have a medical um, that is much more onerous. It's one of the things that I think is is certainly a complaint that I receive from pilots right across Australia. Do you think that there's an opportunity for 
CASA to change its medical requirements to allow for uh, private pilots who are operating light aircraft similar to the size you're proposing your members should be able to fly. Um, they should be um, result, um, not required to have the same medical standards that a jet pilot is. I, I think again, I, I draw on the, the worldwide experience here um, and different models have been employed by different countries around the world. Certainly in the US, that's the model that they opted for where the FAA directly administers these pilots. But again, I, I refer to the examples that uh, I used before the UK, New Zealand, et cetera. Um, their equivalent uh, civil aviation authorities um, have opted to essentially outsource it. And I think one of the benefits, uh, I go back to the opening statements that I made, one of the benefits of that model is that um, uh, firstly, um, it's, it, it, it is accepted around the world um, as, as a, uh, a viable option. Uh, and secondly, it provides benefits back to the, um, in our case, the Australian economy in the sense that the government uh, body responsible for aviation safety in Australia is not directly overseeing an additional 10,000 pilots. And the cost of that uh, administration falls onto us as an organisation. We are almost 100% funded by member funds. And, uh, and so the benefits of um, the weight increase that the CASA is looking to give to us is that they achieve that, that outcome that you've just referred to um, at almost zero cost to the Australian taxpayer and the Australian public. Right, Theo. Uh, Senator Stirl, do you have any additional questions? Thank you. No, I'm fine, thanks, Chair. I, I have been listening intently. I'm, I'm, I'm keen to get the CASA as well. Thank Terrific. you. All right. Uh, look, thank you very much for your, for your evidence today, uh, Mr Link, Mr Monk, and uh, please go with the committee's thanks. And I uh, appreciate the time we spent um, preparing for today. Thank you again for the opportunity. And, uh, and I'll just say that if anyone has any follow up questions, we'd be more than happy to engage offline. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.